my eyes. Hello friends and welcome back to Red X, your source for the freshest daily Reddit content anywhere on the internet, promise, swearsies. Happy New Year's Eve, by the way, hooray. It's gonna be a good 2021, I'll tell you that. We're gonna try out some new stuff in the new year. But for now, we are jumping right back into r slash neckbeard stories with the continuation of the Sir Sam saga by user Lady Saber. Part one is somewhere on my channel. I'll throw a link in the description. If I forget, then you can maybe go through my videos and look for John Cena's face in a plate of spaghetti. And if you can't see John Cena, then, then just look for the plate of spaghetti, I guess. <laughs> But anyways, I'm excited to get back into it. I know you guys are excited to get back into it, so uh, let's get back into it. <laughs> Chase Sir Sam the Chivalrous tries to sword part two, or how a beatus beard literally scarred me for life. Part one is in that video that I previously mentioned. Part one and part one, that makes sense. <laughs> anyways, this will be the seventh installment of Chase Sir Sam the Chivalrous and the long-awaited sequel to the first Sir Sam Tries to Sword. Trigger warning, your jimmies will be rustled. Player one is me, Lady Saber, 16-year-old exchange student from Belgium, very avid fencer, been doing it for about 10 years. Couple this with my Lord of the Rings and a Song of Fire and Ice nerding, and I am Neckbeard Smoosh. Players two and three are my fencing coaches, Mr. and Mrs. Coach, who are a husband and wife couple. Really fabulous people, super dedicated to their sport. Mr. Coach is a large Eastern European mammoth man <laughs> who sounds like a thunderstorm. He looks really intimidating, but he's actually just a big teddy bear in disguise. Mrs. Coach is almost as small as I am, but can still roar like a lion. She tolerates no BS and is intent on making everyone perform better. Player four is smooth-cheeked Sir Sam the Chaste and Chivalrous, the whitest knight of them all. Fat, sweaty, with a high-pitched voice, he has the personality of a nervous Pomeranian, except with more nervous quivering and nervous hate. <laughs> he wears New Balance sneakers, plus 10 speed and 5 health, cargo shorts, plus 20 carry, cool story babe, now make me a sandwich t-shirt, and navy blue trilby with feather in the band, combined for plus 35 negging. <laughs> he also smells like he bathed in Axe chocolate spray cologne. But still, that was unable to mask the scent of rancid meat sauce. God, every time we say that, it's horrible. A small note about the setting. A short wall on the end of our gym functions as a rack for practice weapons. It's somewhat for show, but the weapons are all fully functional, so people who rent gear can use one. If you haven't read the first Sir Sam Tries to Sword, go do that. Seriously, guys, stuff I talk about here will make a lot more sense. This story takes place the week after Christmas break, on Wednesday afternoon. School is back in session, as is fencing practice. I've received a very nice fencing glove from my host family, so I'm intent on practicing with it. I have the same setup going on with my looks as I described in the previous story. No makeup, hair tightly wrapped and out of the way, workout clothes for minus 10 to my attractiveness stat. Funny thing, Sam hasn't once told me that I look naturally beautiful this way like he's always tirelessly plugging. I arrive an hour before practice, earlier than usual. Instead of running in the freezing cold rain, I'm in the gym, putting Mrs. Coach to shame on a leg machine. We take turns one-upping each other until it's getting close to practice time. Mr. and Mrs. Coach go to set up, and I cool down with a short walk indoors and a drink of water. Sir Sam doesn't show up for warm-ups. Wednesday is the one day a week he's signed up for practice, but I'm not surprised if he's avoiding me, or it's just realized that copycatting my interests won't score him any points. I'm not complaining. I get into my zone and have a lot of fun. Instead of conditioning warm-ups, we play dodgeball, and I'm about as unstoppable as a smitten neckbeard's affections. <laughs> We're suiting up for drills when Sir Sam finally arrives. About as welcome as the fire marshal at a dorm party. His hair is so greasy that the rain just beads up on top of it. <laughs> about half of our class are girls, so... They're eyeing him with some venom. Sir Sam is oblivious, but senses a bit of awkwardness in the air, so he tries to break the tension with some light humor. Here I am. <laughs> I just showed up for the fun part. I swear his voice is indistinguishable from Kyle's cousin. I'm big. The coaches hate it when people do this. It's impossible to actually improve your form when all you want to do is show up for the last 45 minutes and swing a blade around. They won't get on your case for this, of course, because... 
you paid for the full session. And if you continue to suck, then you keep coming back for more. <laughs> Flawless plan. Mrs. Coach doesn't want to get near Sam, so Mr. Coach takes him to get the rental gear. Mrs. Coach is explaining the drill to us when they both return. The Sabre group is an odd number again, so I sit the first round out, dressed in my uniform with my mask off. Mrs. Coach asks Sam why he skipped out on the warm-ups today, and Sam goes full conditions. Well, last time the warm-ups made me really tired, and so I couldn't free fence hardly at all. <laughs> yeah, that's the idea. If you keep doing them, eventually you won't be so tired and... But if I'm exhausted, I can't practice the actual fencing, though. It's annoying, because I want to be better at sword fighting, not just doing lunges and footwork. Lunges and footwork are only 80% of fencing anyways. Who needs it? Okay, Sam, let's just get you warmed up before you do drills. Give me two sets of advances and retreat. What? I'm already in my uniform, though. Good. It'll help you warm up faster. Mrs. Coach has a negative zero patience for lazy people. I can tell she's straining. But uh, I had asthma as a kid. If I get too hot, I could have trouble breathing, and I haven't had an inhaler for breathing treatment in forever, so I don't think it's safe. Sam. A few sets of footwork won't kill you. I've got to teach the drills, so let's go, okay? Shit lady game on point, as usual, Mrs. Coach. Sam's a little miffed that Mrs. Coach has no concern for his well-being. I'm the one paying you, so technically I should be the one in charge. And I came here to fence, not do some stupid drill. Mrs. Coach is two inches from snapping, so she gives it up. <sighs> You're right, Sam. Grab a practice foil and jump in with your group. She turns on her heel and goes to instruct the epaists. Sam is smirking like he just won a free pizza for outwitting a fundamentalist Christian. He swaggers to the wall of practice weapons and is drawn to the sabers. I'm standing directly behind him and to his right, watching him out of the corner of my eye. He wraps his sausage fingers around the handle and draws it out of the rack. He's holding it in a two-handed death grip, nowhere near how you're actually supposed to hold a saber. I can see his imagination just whirring away. <laughs> the hamster's running on the wheel. Sir Sam is a Japanese samurai warrior in the midst of an epic battle. He takes a small downcut to split his midget opponent in half. Damn, no one saw that. It was totally epic. His next challenger is cut in half through the middle by a slow motion side stroke. There's an enemy behind him, so he spins with the force of a great typhoon to decapitate his foe with one fell stroke. Unfortunately, he doesn't see Milady in the line of fire. It happens fast. I can see the blade coming towards me, getting bigger and bigger. I try to turn away, lean under the cut, but the weapon connects with the side of my face. There are two things that I remember most about the impact. One is the sickening crunch and the second is the blade dragging through my skin, scraping against the bone as Sam pulls away. To call a saber or any fencing weapon blunt as a butter knife would be overstating the sharpness. It's really nothing more than a rounded piece of iron with a flattened tip. However, if you take two pieces of iron and bang them together a few thousand times, they will get some ragged edges, not to mention hundreds of tiny magnetized shavings clinging on for dear life. My memory's a little bit fuzzy after the hit. Everything runs together in a slurry of Mountain Dew and meat sauce. I got to ride in an ambulance. That was fun. I remember laughing because the siren sounded weird. It's clear again when I wake up in a hospital bed. There's gauze over both eyes with little pinpricks in the center to see out of. The TV sucks, even if I could see the whole screen. Like some sick little joke, My Little Pony is the only show that comes in 100% clear. The rest is shitty reality TV, local news, and soap opera reruns. I'd opt for the soap opera reruns. <laughs> All told, it's an impressive list of injuries. I took a fracture to the zygomatic bone, which is on the outside of the eye socket. I had a grade three lateral concussion. My brain went ping pong from side to side. The laceration caused by the saber needed stitches. The weapon itself scratched my cornea and left more than a dozen fragments behind in my skin and a few in my eye. Some came out with a magnet. The others had to be picked out. They put me under for this, as a number of those fragments were trapped under my eyelids. Jesus Christ. I spent the night in the hospital after getting hit. Once it was clear I didn't have any permanent brain damage or swelling, I went home the next morning. 
I was on some wicked strong painkillers for the next few days. Sweet. <laughs> my face from my cheek to my temple swelled up and throbbed for the rest of the week. Not sweet. <laughs> I avoided mirrors for a long time. Sir Sam sent me flowers and a card. I didn't read the card, but I wish that I had. I'm sure it would have been great material. Additionally, even though what he did was an accident, Mr. and Mrs. Coach knew that I could have easily sued the pants off them, and they disallowed Sam from fencing at their club anymore. Sam, or at least Sam's mom, had to pay to replace my fencing jacket, underarm protector, and lame, about $500 worth of gear. The cut scarred. It started out as thick as my thumb, bright pink, and ran from the corner of my eye to the middle of my temple. It's receded a lot since then and faded to a pale white, but it's not going away any further. I spent a long time being ridiculously self-conscious about it. Now I think it looks fucking badass, <laughs> but, but it's taken me a while to get there. I know this story was more feels than funny, but squeezing humor into this one felt like I was forcing cheese whiz back into the tube, so I cut the awkward, cringy stuff out. I know I said I wouldn't post for a while, and here I am, but I'm a dirty slut for upvotes. <laughs> I'm going to do important real life things now and stop obsessively checking Reddit. I mean it this time, for seriously. If I have my chronology straight, Sir Sam Tries Feminism should be next. So I mean, okay, I guess it was an accident what happened, but I still have a lot of questions. Who paid for the medical bills? Is this covered by the Belgian government or did your host family have to step up? Because the American healthcare system is just a mess, so even if you had to go in and have stitches, some anesthesia to put you under and pull some metal shavings out from under your eyelids. You're looking at thousands, maybe tens of thousands of dollars, which is just insane. I understand why you wouldn't want to sue like Mr. and Mrs. Coach, because they're cool, it's not really their fault, but I probably would take it to Sir Sam one way or the other. I understand it was an accident, but somebody's got to cover these medical bills, dude. How about uh, mental trauma? <laughs> and it seems like according to OP, there was actually some mental trauma, you know? You got a scar on this face that you got to deal with for the rest of your life. And honestly, most of the time, scars look pretty cool, uh, even on chicks. <laughs> I remember when I was like 13 or 14, I would wear an eye patch consistently. And people would be like, how'd you lose your eye? And I'd make up some elaborate story. God, I was, I was so close to being a neckbeard myself. I think that's why I'm so interested in neckbeard stories. <laughs> oh... I'm glad I got past my eye patch phase, whether it was needed or not. And I'm glad you got past your eye patch phase, even though it was definitely needed. Sir Sam is definitely like just a hapless moron, you know? But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't sue the pants off of him regardless. <laughs> I know I would have done. But let us see how the story progresses in the next episode, right now. Chase Sir Sam the Chivalrous tries to feminism. <laughs> God. Or, why telling women that you want to empower them doesn't make for a good negging setup. Hi everyone, it's Lady Saber, back with the 8th installment of Sir Sam. This story takes place the week after Sir Sam put me in the ER. Player 1 is me, Lady Saber, 16 year old foreign exchange student from Belgium. At the time, I'm on some pretty intense painkillers, so I'm as high as a kite. Thankfully, I'm a happy, albeit emotional drunk. The swelling in my face has gone down considerably, and the color has faded from dark purple to yellows and greens. The cut itself is a very visible and angry red, with the stitches still intact. I've laid it on thick with the foundation and concealer, as much as possible, some crazy eyeliner and shadow colors to draw away attention, as well as wearing my hair forward instead of back. As a note, I'm really into strategy games, chess and go being my favorite. Player 2 is Sir Sam the chaste and chivalrous, the whitest knight in all the land. Inconsiderate meat planet with no tolerance for rejection. He wears New Balance sneakers, mid-calf socks, baggy light wash jeans, and a stained This is what the feminist looks like t-shirt under a puffy bubble coat. Thanks, mom! Instead of spaghetti sauce, Sam reeks of Axe chocolate spray cologne. I can't imagine anything else than him seeing this commercial Touch of love. and thinking that that's how it works in real life. He still doesn't shower, but Axe spray is a fine substitute, right? Oh, I forgot the trilby. How could I almost forget the trilby? It's atrocious, as usual, plain gray felt with a black band. Player three is John, the guy I'm crushing on who shares my English class. 
is outdoorsy, athletic, takes no BS, and is actually above average intelligence, great at coming up with creative insults. He and Sam are arch nemesis, wears bootylicious jeans, leather belt with a shiny buckle, a Venture Crew t-shirt, and an American Eagle hoodie. John and I have a way of speaking to each other which sounds horrifying to anyone else. We call each other nasty names as a form of endearment. What's up, bitch? Not too much, you damn slut. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone else talked to me this way, I would probably lose it with them, but for John and I, it's a thing. I don't think that I could stand that, but you do you, boo-boo. <laughs> Player four is my English teacher, Mr. Teacher. Pretty minor character. He's a tall guy, has a lot of fun with his job, usually wears a shirt and tie with some nice pants. He honestly thinks most of the students in his classes are idiots, and he's right. But you'd never know it for his lighthearted demeanor. John and I had gotten pretty sick of chess club's neckbeardy atmosphere, so we decided to found our own Go Club. Mr. Teacher, as it happened, was a pretty big fan of Go as well, and he agreed to be the sponsor and host the club a few times a week. To drum up some interest, we made some signs and posted them around the school, as well as making announcements in classes. I did not know this until that Monday, but one of the teachers who taught at the standard level had walked out of her job in the middle of the week sick of the school system. The affected English classes were being spread around to other English teachers until a replacement could be found. Guess which goober ended up in my class? Lunchtime rolls around on Monday, the opening day for Go Club. It's a fun time, about a dozen people show up. Only Mr. Teacher has an actual Go set with boards and stones. For the rest we have printed paper boards, with black and white M&Ms for pieces. Black and white M&Ms? Bruh, where'd you get them? <laughs> There's a bunch of sheets with the rules and Mr. Teacher and I are helping people to learn. John pairs off to play with somebody else, and I wait for Mr. Teacher to do something on the computer before we start a game. Right on cue, guess who? Sir Sam swaggers in like a drunk circus monkey. He doesn't see me at first, being on the other side of the room. He says, hello, to Mr. Teacher. I hunker down to avoid being spotted, but lo and behold, Sir Oinkles sniffs me out like a truffle. <laughs> He bumbles his way across the room, bonking tables and rubbing against people on the way. He's carrying a half-empty two-liter bottle of Diet Dr. Pepper. Before I know it, he's hovering over me like a black hawk in Somalia. I told y'all Dr. Pepper's the second choice for neckbeards, after the do. <laughs> I'm greeted with a tip of the trilby. Hey, Lady Saber. Glad to see you're back. <laughs> I saw the announcement for this club and... <laughs> Figured that no one but you could be behind it. Wanna play a game? By the way, you look a lot better today. And the backhandiest compliment ever award goes to... Sam plops down into the chair in front of me, and it squeals in agony. <laughs> I should have left right then. Maybe told Sam that I was waiting for someone. I would have, if I hadn't been so damn stoned. My brain wasn't looking for a way out of the situation. It was just saying... Alright, girl, let's put on our seatbelts and do this thing. <laughs> Thanks, brain. Sam gives me an oblivious smile. He makes a pretty big show of removing his jacket to showcase his feminism shirt in all its glory. For Darwin's sake, there's a light-colored stain on the hem. <laughs> he opens his lunchbox and sets up a buffet. Chicken salad, tuna salad, thing of chips, and goddamn shit-filled ravioli again. The eruption of smell is on the nuclear level. People ask, what is that? And Sam proudly obliges his fully loaded spork. He starts shoveling it into his mouth like a freshly dug grave. <laughs> I'm about to play as black when he sets a piece down as white. Sam, black goes first. Nuh-uh, it's just like a chess. White goes first. I'm not in the mood to argue with someone so smart who clearly knows everything there is to know about the game, so I let him make up his own rules as we go along. He takes a swig from his bottle, backwashes half of it, and rips a belt that would put Robert Baratheon to shame. It turns most of the heads in the room, and Sam thinks that this is the funniest thing in the world. He giggles like a small child and scarfs a few M&Ms. <laughs> John can see that I'm in trouble and stands up to intervene. If something goes south on the first day though, I doubt anyone will want to come again. John and Sam make eye contact, and I ward off John with a shake of my head. Sam smirks at John like he's the one who stared him down, and he turns back to me with one arm draped over the back of his seat and soda bottle in one hand. The most interesting man in the world. <laughs> 
He thinks he looks cool, but he just looks like an alcoholic. <laughs> you know, John isn't a feminist. Do you always begin conversations this way? I was recently introduced to the Princess Bride while on bed rest, so I shamelessly make references. <laughs> Not really, I guess. Well, I've been reading a lot about feminism lately, and how women should be empowered to make their own choices and shit, and John isn't the kind of guy who would be a feminist. He'll just, like, you know, fucking go up and put his arm around you without your consent. <laughs> I think that's pretty messed up. Oh, just like Sir Sam did in the first Sir Sam Tries the Sword story. Huh. <laughs> Sam sounds like an 11-year-old on Xbox Live, and it physically hurts to listen. He's onto the chips now, and barbecue-flavored dust is building up in dull orange snowdrifts. Crumbs are accumulating on his lips as well, like the crust on a creme brulee. Mmm, but not really. <laughs> now, I'm not the kind of person that wants to be asked every five seconds, Is this okay? May I hold your hand? I like it when someone can read my signals of approval or disapproval and handle the situation with confidence. I'm laughing at your joke? All right. I see you touching my elbow. I'll touch your elbow too. Yeah, I'm cool with your arm around my waist. Whoa, okay, that hand's getting a little low. Notice how I shrugged my hips? Yeah, there you go. Stay right there. This is how people actually communicate, not by narrating every physical action to each other and begging for approval or pardon. Just facts. His whole image is so comical and ridiculous. I can't help but giggle like an idiot. I don't want to, but I can't help myself. Inconceivable, I reply in my drug-addled, lilting voice. That's funny too, so I go into another fit of giggles. Sam takes my actions as genuine interests, not that I can really blame him, I guess. He powers through like it's his second plate of mashed potatoes, clearly impressed that I can analog with his extraordinary lexicons. I know, right? <laughs> I also really hate how the patriarchy forces women to uphold unrealistic beauty standards. Stupid stuff like makeup and heels. I think it would be great if everyone could just liberate themselves from double standards. I still don't get why you feel like you have to wear makeup so much. Honestly, you look just as good without it. For half of this time, his eyes are drifting up to the cut on my face. It's making me feel really self-conscious, so I turn my head to hide it almost to the extent that I'm looking directly away from him. I don't think things like blemishes or cuts and scars and stretch marks need to be covered up. Honestly, most of that stuff is pretty sexy. He wipes his hands on his shirt, leaving orange tiger stripes for plus five melee combat strength. <laughs> oh, you got me. That's a good one. This pushes me in the opposite direction of giggles. My throat catches, and I can feel tears welling up. I excuse myself, run to the bathroom, and spend about ten minutes crying. I do come back, but not to Sam's game. Instead, I slide a chair up next to John and get a much-needed hug. We stay this way for the rest of lunch, with Sam eyeing us disdainfully from across the room. When the bell rings, Sam makes a valiant approach to rescue Milady from the patriarchy. Hello, Lady Sable. Are you okay? If I hurt your feelings, I didn't... And John cuts in. Fuck off, Sam. I wasn't speaking to you, John. I was talking to... Lady Saber doesn't want to talk to you. Fuck off. I think the lady can speak for... Last chance, Sam. Sam puts his hands up in mocking defensiveness and backpedals. <laughs> okay, then. Just try to help. At least I'm not this guy, right? <laughs> he tips his hat and excuses himself with a... Good day, my lady. <laughs> he turns more into Gollum as this goes on. This is, of course, not the end. Overnight, I manage to develop a shiner as some of the blood from the side of my face pools near my eye. Makeup saves the day, but it's not totally hidden. After school, Sam is hovering nearby like there's a ribbon cutting at a new McBeatus while John and I talk near the bus loop. John, in our usual fashion, tells me that I'm a fabulous bitch muffin and my great white whale, I mean champion is close at hand to defend my lady's honor. John, what did you just call Lady Saber? John gives him a quizzical look. I turn to Sam. It's fine. He didn't mean it like, Holy shit, Lady Saber. Is that a black eye? Entirely too loud. People all around are now looking at us like we're from the zoo. Jesus Christ, John. Did you fucking hit her? No, John replies. 
My French instincts kick in as I retreat to his side. <laughs> uh, oh, sir, deny it all you want, but we can all see that bruise. Sam, Lady Saber has a bruise because you hit her in the face with a piece of metal, you heroically stupid cunt. He doesn't have much of an answer for that, so he derails the train wreck even further. Why do you use the word cunt like it's an insult? You know, female body parts aren't inferior, John. And I'm sure others would agree that sexist language isn't very becoming. Not that someone who isn't a gentleman would understand. Okay, how about I call you a dick then? <laughs> Whatever you say, delusional shit rocket. John gives Sam a sweeping bow before turning his back and boxing him out. Sam skulks off. Why can't my lady just appreciate his concern for my lady's well-being? <laughs> he texts me later. Hey, I understand how hard it is to be in an abusive relationship like that, but I'm here if you need someone to talk to. I'm not in an abusive relationship. Okay, if you say so, but the offer still stands, lol. Sam, you need to stop forcing yourself between me and John. That evening, John and I make ourselves... Facebook official! Da, 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 da. That's the most official kind of official. <laughs> There's no reply from the buttery front except for a cascade of Facebook posts. He thought he deleted all of them, but by some miracle, trigger warning, OP gets wrecked, this one survives. If you need any more validification... <laughs> God, it's a mess already. That women don't tend towards nice guys... Just look at the sheer number who stay in obliquious relationships with guys who strike, maltreat, and castigate them. Why would you willingly endure such erroneousness unless some satisfaction was ultimately derived? Seriously? Number one, you talk like you're fucking Shakespeare or some shit. <laughs> Calm down. You ain't. Second, are you seriously blaming girls who get beat up by their boyfriends for getting beat? How retarded do you gotta be? As someone who was in an abusive relationship for two years, fuck you sideways with a glass bottle. No one wants to be in that situation. The only reason you stay is because you're afraid that they'll kill you if you leave, and that asshats like you will blame you for the abuse. Also, yeah, you're not as smart as you think you are. Okay, damn, chill. <laughs> All I'm saying is that some girls go for assholes. Yeah, it's sad that some girls get beat up, but honestly, if you just give nice guys a chance... It wouldn't happen. <laughs> Serious question. Were you thrown against the wall as a kid? <laughs> it's not like some guy is going to tell you, oh, hey, by the way, I like to beat up on my girlfriend. Girls out there every day get beat up, raped, drugged, fucking killed by crazy boyfriends. And all you got to say is, if you don't touch my dick, then you deserve it. No wonder everyone thinks you're a fucking tool. Damn. You just love to see people get blasted on their own Facebook posts. <laughs> OP did get wrecked so hard. That's that's glorious. I'm super glad we cut that in. <laughs> John and I cut school the next morning to go see The Hobbit. You need a break from that fat dick fart. <laughs> so eloquent. We go to lunch and spend the afternoon shopping. I, like most European exchange students, went nuts buying cheap clothes in American department stores. Sam, of course, does not miss an opportunity to text me that John is clearly a bad influence on my education. Thanks, Dad. The following day at school, I'm looking fierce in a leather biker jacket, white tank underneath, dark wash jeans, and boot heels. In English, we're working in the computer lab, and Sam gets assigned a seat near me. He's still snacking and chugging a huge bottle of Coke, despite the no-eating-or-drinking rule, the poor sap in between us can't stop Sam from crawling over him. <laughs> Leaning over his keyboard and getting in the way to blather on about how It's so great that I'm destroying the gender binary by wearing androgynous clothing. Eventually, the guy between us gets tired of cringing. Dude, shut up. Sam retreats into his place but doesn't stop talking or stuffing his face for a single second. He goes full fat logic towards the end of this rant telling me around multiple mouthfuls and in way too much detail why fat girls are prettier than skinny girls. 99% of people's body types are totally genetic, no matter what. I mean, we're all fat when we're born anyways. <laughs> that may be true, but I don't think I've ever met someone who was born a Gorillasaurus. Like, 
I bet you'd be a lot better off if you just ate more. He finishes with a satisfied chuckle and a fistful of cheese puffs. <laughs> I eat more than 3,000 calories a day to maintain my workout schedule, and that's mostly vegetables and real food, full of stuff that your body actually wants. Not neon orange and green packaged garbage full of sodium hexamabetus and methyl ethyl nasty shit. <laughs> If people's body types are genetic, then why is hating on skinny girls okay? Shit malating intensifies. I'm not hating, I mean, plus, you can always just eat more. Yeah, and you can always just exercise more too. Plus 500 XP, shit malady, level up. <laughs> Gosh, Lady Saber, I had no idea you were so body negative. Some people have medical conditions like asthma and heart disease, so they can't exercise no matter what. Plus, your body type is determined at birth, so you can't change it. I have asthma, so are you blaming me for my genes? No one, asthma or otherwise, should be able to breathe with that much food clogging their face hole. <laughs> I defuse the cringe bomb, though, and let him off with, yeah, you're right. He turns away with a satisfied smirk, having clearly bested Milady in a duel of wits. To this day, I do not know from where this feminism charade sprouted forth. I'm assuming he saw something like this image, but I still don't know. This guy was watching the VMAs with me and now he's educating himself. How precious is that? He keeps asking me all these questions about aspects of feminism and he's like, so basically it's about letting women do what they want without being judged for it? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, oh, okay. That's so simple. Why isn't everyone a feminist? It's precious. Update, I banged him. <laughs> Regardless, he definitely thought that it would be a great ploy to get him laid. Unfortunately, he forgot you also have to have a personality. I would detail more as interactions like this go on for the next two weeks, but we've already got ourselves a supersized with extra fries story as it is. I'd hoped to publish this story last night, or maybe this morning, but anything I write after 11.30 p.m. is basically shit. So I spent most of today fixing what I messed up. Merry Christmas, my lords and my ladies, and may you have a most euphoric new year. Oh, isn't that so fitting for this time of year? Hooray! I'm trying to keep our timelines equal, if you couldn't tell, so we can hit hyperdrive. <laughs> and then we can warp into the neckbeard dimension. And then we'll have endless stories and endless content, and it will be a wonderful time for all, unless you're a m'lady. <laughs> This story is so fitting because a lot of guys that come out and tout their pro-feminism actually end up to be like the biggest predators of all. It's basically like a wolf in sheep's clothing type of situation. And unfortunately, sometimes it works. But on the other hand, a bit more fortunately, uh, Sir Sam is nowhere near smart enough to make it work. I much prefer the term egalitarian, you know, I think that uh, everybody should have equal rights. But I mean, it is a touchy subject, especially in 2020 or 2021 as it is. <laughs> so I try not to touch it with a 10 foot pole. People ask me that question. I'm like, OK, what's your angle? <laughs> Why do you care? Sometimes you can just enjoy somebody's company and you don't got to get it all mucky mucked with politics and such. Sir Sam, of course, the scumbag as usual. Nothing has really changed, except now he goes on diatribes about how women need to be empowered. Whoopie-doo. <laughs> Were you trying to empower Lady Saber by hitting her in the face with a sword? Very empowering. <laughs> I also think Lady Saber had a pretty good point about that body positivity movement. She's like, okay, then why is hating on skinny girls okay? Hmm, there's something to take home and chew on. Think about, you know, if you go on social media and you see a hot girl in a swimsuit, people are like, oh, she's a bitch, she's shallow, blah, blah, blah. If you see a fat girl on a, in a swimsuit, people are like, oh, beautiful, how brave. <laughs> people are so fake, man. Oh, there's been so much cringe already, but I think I'm ready for another story. What do you say, guys? Let's hop into it. I mean, guys and girls. I don't want to be a, a sexist or anything. <laughs> Sir Sam the Chivalrous tries to atheism, or why debating in real life is harder without a thesaurus. <laughs> I thought he was an atheist already. I guess maybe I assumed that. Anyways, hi everyone, it's Lady Saber, back with the ninth installment of Sir Sam. The story takes place after the previous, but somewhat in tandem with Sir Sam's feminism streak. <laughs> That's killer. 
Sorry it's taken me a while to write this story. I had to nail down a few projects in real life. I also encountered a PC game called This War of Mine, which is fucking fantastic, and you should definitely play it. Even five years later, it's still fucking fantastic. You should definitely play it. <laughs> As a note to new readers, we're far enough along in this series where re-explaining all the background and settings would probably be pretty boring to the regulars. If you haven't read the other stories, go find Miladybot in the comments and slurp up that euphoric, carbonated goodness. Player one is me, Lady Saber. Still recovering from my face bashing incident, but doing much better. The coloration is normalized significantly, and I'm slowly coming off the painkillers. The cut itself is closing enough that I don't have to bandage it regularly, although it's still very noticeable. Player two is Sir Samuel Smoothcheeks, the chaste and chivalrous knight. Enormous butter parade, socially impotent, with a terminal diagnosis of nice guy TM syndrome. Wears New Balance, baggy jeans, wide brim brown fedora, and a corduroy jacket. Zero out of ten, would not tip. Smells like he bathes and brushes his teeth with spaghetti sauce, thickly veiled with Axe chocolate body spray. Also a militant atheist, sent to Earth by Dawkins himself to enlighten the world with his own intelligence. Ah, oh, we'll all be euphoric soon. <laughs> this story takes place at Go Club. There's about 15 people there today, all playing with black and white M&Ms. After helping some of the new members set up, I sit down to eat my lunch, well ensconced in the back corner of the room. Everyone's favorite cringe factory shows up late. The door to the room is locked, so he grabs the handle and throttles it like his firstborn child. <laughs> Jerking it back and forth while pressing his face against the tiny slit of glass, you'd think a horde of zombies were behind him. The fast kind too, from the World War Z movie. Those fuckers were scary. Mr. Teacher is visibly annoyed, and reluctantly gets up from his desk to open the door for Sir Sam. The human hippo saunters in and acknowledges Mr. Teacher with a tip of the hat before scanning the room. He spots me quickly and moves in my direction, much in the way that a derailed freight train might move towards a children's cancer clinic. <laughs> <laughs> Tables are bumped. Sorry. Boards and pieces shift. My bad. Insides brush like the Titanic brushed the iceberg. Who's the boat and who's the iceberg is somewhat unclear in this situation. At long last, he reaches me and finds that there's no chair for him to plop into. No problem. An empty chair is located at another table group and dragged across the tile floor, making the same grinding screech as Satan's pet goose. Satisfied, he plops in and with a tip of the brim, breaks out lunch. Two bags, two enormous things of fries, and a big gulp cup. He starts unwrapping this feast in front of me, carefully peeling back the grease-infused paper like it's Christmas morning. I know that he's a chow hound, but this is just insane. I got you some lunch. Oh, did you sprinkle in a side of Rohypnol just for me? <laughs> Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> I had to sneak off campus to get it. He says this like he just Mission impossible his way into a Burger King, when in reality, Sneaking off campus involves nothing more than walking out the back doors with dozens of other underclassmen. I've already got lunch, Sam, I said, indicating my small plate of sushi. That's your fucking lunch? Jesus, Lady Saber. No wonder you're so skinny. You need to eat more. Because you're just the gold standard of dietary health. <laughs> Sam, if you're going to be mean, I'm not going to talk to you today. I had recently started Sir Sam on a diet, figuratively speaking. If he said something mean, gross, or made a sad attempt at negging, I'd tell him so and stop responding for the rest of the day. He's moved past having a temper tantrum at this point and will either sulk or furiously backpedal. Okay, okay, it was just a fucking joke. Seriously though, lunch, I got two burgers and fries plus a drink. Being a communist, socialist, fascist, terrorist European, I'm not overly fond of hamburgers or fast food. I don't like the taste and the greasy texture makes me want to gag. I don't mind soda, but that cup looks like it's the size of my torso. I don't even think I could drink that much water. I've got my own lunch, Sam. No thanks. Sam looks a little frustrated, but can't see a way to talk me into it. So he dives into the buffet, inhaling both cups of fries with his mouth vacuum, before demolishing one double-stacked burger. Food goes in, tiny projectiles of meat slurry are ejaculated back. You can't explain that. 
I shift to the side, trying to keep my plate and eye out of the blast radius of this volcanic eruption. I listen to sloppy mouth chewing while my appetite disintegrates like soggy cheese puffs. Ugh. By now, Sir Sam has pulled out his phone and begun his odd way of stimulating conversation. He loads a video on YouTube, cranks up the volume on the speakers, and overacts his reaction to said video. I hope people do that with Red X. <laughs> Today, the video of choice is an episode of The Atheist Experience, though I hadn't heard of it yet. Try as I might to tune out the low-quality blaring audio, it's Sam's over-the-top, Oh man, he fucking got told, that pushes me over. Sam, can you turn that off? It's really loud. It's the atheist experience. Thank you for providing the appropriate answer to my request. I'm about to respond, but I must have given away a confused look because he immediately cuts me off. You've never heard of the atheist experience? OMG, no I haven't. Please tell me more, 111. Dude, whoa, cool. No, but... Oh man, it's the press. These guys take calls from like religious whack jobs and totally show them up every time. It's so funny. <laughs> You've really never heard of it before? No, I haven't. Want to watch this episode with me? Romantic. <laughs> Sorry, Sam. Doesn't sound like my thing. Oh, no. Please don't tell me that you go to church. He phrases this almost rhetorically, like he knows someone who's almost as smart as he is wouldn't possibly fall for the diverse intellectual fallacies of organizationalized religion, right? Yeah. I'm an agnostic, but I still go to Catholic Church. Do I believe what they spout? No, for the most part. Do I support the doctrine? Absolutely not. My father is religious, though, so we go as a family. And I've always enjoyed the community and volunteer stuff. I know a number of other church-going atheists who feel the same way. However, in a moment of madness, I challenge him to a battle of wits. For the princess! To the death! He accepts. I accept. Seriously? Super serial. Yes, I go to church. Sam isn't quite sure how to respond to this, so he leans over the desk and rests his forehead against the side of his hand. After a few seconds of despondence at the magnitude of my lady's ignorance, he collects his jimmies and presses onwards. Why? Seriously, how could you support the most genocidal organization known to man? Because my family's religious, so I go with them. Oh, well... It's not really your fault for being indoctrinated. I mean, <laughs> so was I, but then I learned to think for myself. <laughs> I can see where this is going, so I try to disengage. I go to work with my nail file, attempting to overact my disinterest in this topic. However, subtlety is not exactly Sam's strong suit. I know, I'm a slow learner. The euphoric gentle sir cannot neglect this opportunity to enlighten my lady. Still, I think everyone has a responsibility to liberate themselves from that institution. The church just doesn't do anyone any good at all, and it never has. They've just been killing other people and each other for thousands of years, and all because of religion, and they use their Bible to justify it. There's just no point, and nothing good ever comes out of it. He talks in circles like this for a full 10 minutes before running out of steam, and having to rehydrate with whatever's sloshing around in that now half-empty big gulp, and I have managed to grind a flat spot in my thumbnail. Damn it. Remember how I mentioned the volunteer stuff? But what about all the charity work that people do? You said it yourself. People do. They don't need the church. People should just do good things just for being good, not because they think a magic sky wizard wants them to. He's leaning halfway across the table, hands clasped mightily in the center. I actually looked up the atheist experience afterwards, and I realized that Sam was trying his hardest to imitate one of the guys on the show. It hurts to think about. I halfway agree with his thought, but without the church, wouldn't it be kind of hard to find a platform to do charity work? Nonsense. I wish I was kidding. Anyone can start a charity and do good deeds. Okay, what's one that you know of? He can't actually name any, and instead falls back on, I think if you're a truly good person, you don't need the promise of heaven. I think that if you're a truly good person, you do good things, but I'm not smart enough to understand Sir Sam's intellectual reasonings anyways. Sir Sam's anger is starting to bubble like a shaken dew bottle, but he's straining to keep it civil, 
The second burger is made as a sacrifice to his stress <laughs> and devoured in three bites, just before he's saved by the bell and makes a quick exit. That evening, right on cue, Facebook gets doused like a Gitmo detainee. <laughs> this post and this argument are the only survivors. Indubitably, brilliant persons still manage to fall victim to the disgusting organizationalized destruction of independent understanding called church. If you side with science, logic will never fail you. Please don't feed the church. You know, not everyone who's religious is a bad person. Yep. Not true. By maintaining the lineage of murderous bloodshed that is fraught preceding millennia, you're perpetuating identical logical fallacies and further systemized depression of enlightened persons. Lol, what? <laughs> Bonus points for SAT words. Seriously though, how am I supporting stuff like the Spanish Inquisition by going to church even though I'm not a Catholic? Protestant churches are offshoots of the Catholic hierarchical system. They're really products of the same topiary. Okay, whatever that was supposed to mean. God has helped a lot of people though through hard times, myself included, and guess what? I didn't need to hurt anyone. Those people who did bad things in the Lord's name will know God and get their judgment, just like everyone else, including you. <laughs> That's hilarious. In all seriousness, the ones who can judge others are others themselves. There's no magic invisible wizard in the sky who's going to let you spend the rest of eternity doing whatever people do in heaven. Because you're Protestant, your god will probably not even let you in the pearly gates, even if he was real. Also, heaven is hotter than hell. I think it's really funny that I know more about the Bible than religious people. I'm so glad that we've taken a moment to bask in that shining, euphoric enlightenment. Similar to his femmanism, Sam's atheism is a long-term ordeal, and I can't document every delicious encounter at length, would that I could, without sacrificing other parts of the saga. Sir Sam Tries to Nerd should be the next story. What a douche. I kind of follow along the lines of Lady Saber. I don't go to church, personally, but I'm not going to fault people that do, you know what I mean? My wife is a Catholic, I'm a Protestant, but kind of they're just words. <laughs> like I think if you have good in your heart, then you don't have anything to worry about. Sir Sam obviously does not have good in his heart because he's trying at every twist and turn to manipulate his way into Lady Saber's pants, ain't that right? <laughs> Isn't there something in the Bible about don't cast judgment or something? And I got nothing against atheists or agnostics or Buddhists or whatever you are, as long as you aren't out there trying to judge other people and force them into your way of thinking. We can, we can all be cool, we can have different beliefs, believe it or not, and still be friends. There's nothing wrong with that at all. It's only when somebody decides that you, you have to see this their way that things start to fall apart. But then again, Sir Sam seems like he's been falling apart for years, so <laughs> maybe this is just what we should come to expect. Anyways, we'll get one more story in here and then I gotta get out of here, do some New Year's stuff. So that means there'll be one more part of the Sir Sam saga. And I thank you guys so much for riding along with me. Let's get into it. Sir Sam tries to charity or how a neckbeard got in the back door. Hello, my lords and my ladies. It's Lady Saber, back with the 10th installment of Sir Sam. This story takes place about a week after the previous two. As a note to new readers, this being the 10th installment of the story, re-explaining the background for all the settings and such wouldn't be much fun for the regulars. My lady bot is somewhere in the comments with all of the previous stories, so grab a bucket of cheese balls and start there. Let's get our jimmies ready. Player one is me, Lady Saber. Pretty social personality, but uncomfortable in large groups of people that I don't know. I'm wearing a dark blue full-length dress, matching earrings and nude heels. My hair's let down and curled gently over one shoulder to cover the cut on the side of my face. Player two is John, my finally official boyfriend. He's looking sharp, wearing a white shirt under a matching light blue vest and tie, pressed pants and polished shoes. He's a much smoother dancer than I am, has a bit of a temper, and will inflate when provoked. It's pretty funny. Player three is Sir Samuel Smoothcheeks, the chaste and chivalrous knight. Creepier than a millipede's legs, he has a high-pitched voice and needs lotion to slip through doorways. I would describe his appearance, but I'm saving that little morsel for later. So this story takes place mostly at our school's winter dance. It's not quite the prom, but it's still a black tie affair. It's hosted on February the 14th and raises money for a charity. 
This year, it's supporting a local women's shelter and support network in the city. There are a bunch of silly traditions that everyone follows. The girls ask the guys to be their dates. There's a race between someone in a chicken suit and the school mascot afterward. All this stuff is designed to drum up interest and get more people to buy tickets. The week before the 14th, Sam pays me a visit at Go Club. The whole scene reminds me of the beginning to lose yourself by Eminem. If you had one shot, one opportunity to seize everything that you wanted to capture, just let it slip. He makes a big show of himself, making his proposal in front of everyone at Go Club. He's wearing his usual beard gear, TM, with extra crust. He scratches his head before extending the same hand for me to shake. Ugh. <laughs> Yo, his palms are sweaty, knees weak, arms are heavy. This vomit on his sweater already. Mom's spaghetti. He's nervous, but on the surface, he looks calm already. Okay, I don't think those weird stains are actually puke, but he smells bad enough. <laughs> The axe makes a cover about as good as this cover. And, uh... He shifts his weight a few times and goes through a series of nervous ticks before smoothing out his jimmies and asking, Lady Sable, do you want to, like, go with me to, like, the winter dance thingamabob? To drop bombs, but he keeps on forgetting what he wrote down. The whole crowd goes so loud, he opens his mouth, but the words won't come out. I just, uh, you know, think it'll be, like, a lot of fun. And I mean, like, all my friends are going, so it'll be a big group, and, like, I think it'll be a lot of fun. There's a pause. I, I got you something. He produces a small bouquet of white chrysanthemums and roses from his backpack, crinkled and slightly wilted. I don't know why, but this memory always reminds me of macaroni art. Time's up! Over! Blow! <laughs> I think it's worth mentioning that in Belgium, those are the flowers that you bring to a funeral. <laughs> I'm blushing bright red. It's dead quiet and everyone is looking at me, including Mr. Teacher who is trying to hold back a cringe giggle. <laughs> Sam, I'm going with John. Snap back to reality. Oh, there goes gravity. Oh, there's rabbit. He choked and he's so mad, but he won't give up that easy. Nope. There's more shock on his face than the victim of an electric chair. How could I reject him? He did all the things right. He had a compelling speech, an irresistible gift, and he even proved his alphaness by ignoring the traditional rules of the dance. He quickly falls back to, Well, I mean, <laughs> just as, as friends, of course. <laughs> Much in the same way that one might fall from a roof. I tell him again that I'm going with John. Well, has he asked you yet? Well, no. <laughs> well, looks like you're pretty much as single as a pingo. <laughs> no, Sam. John is still my boyfriend, and I can't have two dates. He turns and slouches away, tossing the flowers into the trash can with as much reluctance as throwing out a can of raviolis. <laughs> he glances over his shoulder to make sure that I'm watching the symbolic gesture. The rest of the club starts buzzing as Sam storms out. I didn't actually ask John until a few days before, just to make him sweat a little. The dance is held off campus at a large indoor venue. Nice high ceilings, great acoustics, hardwood floors. One wall is almost all windows, so from the outside you can see everyone having a good time, and from the inside you can see who's arriving. John and I buy our tickets at the door. You pay 20, 30, or 50 dollars for a ticket, so John drops 60 for both of us. Ball in. <laughs> it's a fun time. There's a ton of snacks and almost everyone has showed up. Sam, however, is blessedly absent. I get to have a night of fun, unimpeded by his beardism. <laughs> right. About half an hour in, a limousine pulls up outside the building. It's cleverly disguised as Sam's minivan. <laughs> Sam and six other members of the invasion force pile out one side, kicking and bumping each other through the sliding door. It's a mixed munchies bag. Half her skinny and half her fat. All but one is wearing a hat. Tee <laughs> That rhymes. <laughs> I grab John and we move to a place where we can see the lobby to watch the Mummers troop enter through the front doors. A banana cop who prevents them from going inside without tickets is nearly eaten. Apparently they have no idea that this is a charity event because there's a significant scuffle at the ticket table. John and I are transfixed, nomming a handful of grapes while the plaid armored hedge knights argue about the tickets before angrily leaving. They pace on the sidewalk outside peering in the window like well-fed Le Miserable orphans before walking off in the other direction. I think I've dodged a firing squad, 
until the next line dance. I'm grabbing a drink when Sir Sam cha-chas real smooth up behind me, laying a warm, sweaty palm on my exposed shoulder. <laughs> hey, Lady Sable. Happy Valentine's Day. Seven, save us. He's wearing brown loafers, khakis, a plaid flannel shirt tucked in under a dark suit jacket, a crooked striped tie, and a pinstripe navy blue trilby to top it all off. My eyes! Oh yes, and I forgot, the cane! Yes, a dark straight cane is in his other hand, leaning away from his hip. Nymeria's 10,000 what's? I have to pull myself out of the euphoria to respond. You too? I thought I saw your group leave just now. <laughs> yeah, we went to the school first because we thought we were supposed to go there. Then they wanted to charge us some retarded amount of money to get in here. You know it's for charity, right? He's surprised by that, but tries to hide it. <laughs> yeah, we knew, but still, $20 is way too much. <laughs> that good old atheism charity, huh? I'm about to ask how he managed to get in when I notice the semicircle of his compatriots forming up around him. I'm by myself, pinned between them and the snack table, a little worried about a stampede. <laughs> From here, I'll just refer to Sam's friends by the color trilby that they're wearing. Blue lifts his hat by the brim in greeting, revealing a sweaty crust of blonde hair underneath. So, you're the Lady Sable we heard so much about. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I laugh nervously. Each gentle sir introduces himself with a tip. Mr. White, Mr. Blue, Mr. Black, Mr. Navy, Mr. Green, and Hatless. They're all dressed in a similarly ridiculous array as Sir Sam, though none can top his cane. Mr. Gray and Mr. Navy are skinny, and the only one that looks like he's googled men's formal wear is hatless. The circle presses in a little tighter, as an unintelligible flood of compliments surge at me like a shaken up bottle of dew. Wow, your dress looks good. You look good in that dress. Is your hair really blown? Hey, it's cute. How much you like games? You said cute. You don't need any makeup. Mr. Black tries to touch my hair. I'm quickly saved as John and company force an opening into the circle and pull me out as a spokesperson from the beneficiary takes to the stage to give a speech. Everyone shuts up and turns to listen, except for the world's greatest feminist. <laughs> Sam sidles up on my right side. John already occupies my left and has an arm around my waist. The speaker starts with her spiel, and Sam has a witty remark for every other line. We've managed to raise almost $100,000. <laughs> yeah, because you fucking overcharge everyone. For an optional charity event. I've been working for this organization for years. Probably just because your boss likes your tits. <laughs> Feminism. Wow. She runs the damn thing. And I just wanted to tell you how grateful I am for all of this generosity. Yeah, we're like paying your fucking salary. They're all volunteers. After each hilarious one-liner, Sam turns to look at me making sure I'm able to bask in the warm, moist glow of his good comedic taste. I make no reply, pretending to be intent on the speaker, but that doesn't stop Sir Sam. Milady clearly just didn't hear her champion's japes. <laughs> japes? <laughs> I pronounce it to be the most whimsical jape of the season. <laughs> he also fidgets and itches himself while edging closer, making it painfully clear that he wants to touch me, somehow. This continues for the entirety of the five to 10 minute talk. John is getting wound up, silently squeezing my waist like a cheese whiz packet. Sam blithely continues on with his humor until the people around us start to shush him. Like any classy alpha male gentleman, he makes mocking faces, but eventually stops talking. Eventually though, he chances one last remark to win Milady's hands. Sam leans in close and drops his voice low. It's pretty funny. <laughs> All of us snuck in through a door around the back. Are you serious? He grins smugly. Milady should clearly be impressed by his cunning. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't even locked. People are such idiots. You cheated a charity out of more than a hundred dollars. He doesn't see a problem with this at all. In fact, it's almost an accomplishment. Yeah, so we showed up and gave our support. They already have tons of money. By now, a roar of applause goes up and people start to make their exit. John and I make our escape like the last two egg noodles at the end of his speech and lose ourselves in the crowd. It isn't until after the chicken race that Sam is able to locate us again. Hey, Lady Sable! 
sorry I lost you guys earlier. Can you give me a ride home? Again. <laughs> Jean and I have separated as I'm waiting for him to bring his truck back from the parking lot. So I'm pretty much as single as a Pringle, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a ride. My mom just dropped us off. Could you take me home? What about your friends? Oh, well, I guess they need a ride too. <laughs> How many people can you fit? I don't know, Sam. It's not my car. There's a few awkward minutes of standing around before John returns. The rest of the Beatus Brigade starts to trickle in. John finally pulls up next to the sidewalk, and Sam makes like a rabbit kin to hop on in. Heh, <laughs> that rhymes. <laughs> He's clambered halfway through the passenger door when John tries to stop him. Sam, what the hell are you doing? I need a ride, John. Dude, I don't have space for you and your herd. Well, how am I supposed to get home then? What would this evening be without a good vintage wide? <laughs> Sam, that ain't really my problem. He backs out and stands on the road, giving his hat a tip and holding the already open door for me as I climb in the cab. <laughs> I don't want to think about what he's looking at as he's standing behind me. Hey, John, do you think we can ride in the back? You mean the truck bed? Yeah, there's plenty of room. I'm more worried about the towing capacity than the room. <laughs> Sam, I don't even know where you guys live, and I can't spend all night driving around. John and I exchange a look of, why do we even need to have this conversation? It's okay. We all live close by. Mr. White just lives over in Bumshartville. <laughs> That's like a half an hour away. Seriously, just call your mommy and get her to pick you guys up. Lady Saber and I have to go. Please? Can you just drop us off at my house then? My mom can't pick us up. We're going to be stuck here and like, it's cold. <laughs> Got a layer of blubber to keep you warm, don't you? John and Sam don't actually live that far apart, but more on that later. It might have been easy to just drive away, but John relents and they climb into the truck bed. Sam still makes a bid to share the front seat with my lady, but the door is mysteriously locked. <laughs> From the huffing and puffing, you'd think that they just scaled the wall barehanded. Mr. Gray, who can't physically manage it, has to be hoisted up. <laughs> After the whole crew is in, Sam slaps the back window twice, leaving a greasy palm print. Hatless was nowhere to be seen, but everyone forgot about that at the time. The ride home is comical. Hold on to your trilbies, folks. Part of this ride is on the freeway, and at 60 miles an hour, even the crustiest hair flaps in the breeze like soggy potato chips. Sam hoots and hollers while a few members of his team look like they're about to be sick. Less than a mile from his house, Sam loses his hat. He looks like he's about to cry, <laughs> but he puts on a brave face. The original plan was to drop me off first, but I really don't want these guys knowing where I live, so the gentle sirs are dropped off before me. At Sam's house, sure enough, his minivan is happily parked in the driveway. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> You'd think if Sir Sam didn't spend so much money on hats <laughs> and ridiculous ploys for lady's affection, he, he would have been able to buy a minivan of his very own already. But no, it just keeps on coming with the... The whimsical japes. <laughs> I love that LP used that word. God, that is just choice. <laughs> so wonderful. Uh, I'd really like to continue with the uh, Sir Sam saga, but we're going to have to save it for a part three. It might even be a beefy part three. I think there's about five parts left. So roughly all around the same size, an hour each. And then I'll cut it into like a three and a half hour video as a nice treat. I think it's super funny that John took Sir Sam down the freeway with like, <laughs> with like a bunch of lardos in the back. That's hilarious. Let Highway Patrol see that. You're going to be pulled over in like less than a second. <laughs> and then imagine them all jumping out and trying to run away. <laughs> Comedy gold. I probably would have like jerked him around even a little bit more. Go into a parking lot and do some donuts and stuff. I remember one time me and my little brother were in the back of my stepdad's truck. <laughs> Bad idea. He thought it was super funny to like slam on the brakes and we totally flew into the back side of the truck, hit the tailgate. I smacked my head super hard, which probably explains some things about me now that I come to think about it. <laughs> Just kidding. Maybe <laughs> the story's true. The rest of it, uh, I can't speak on it. You let me know what you think in the comments. I sincerely hope that you've enjoyed this episode. I hope that your New Year's is fantastic. I hope you grab 2021 by the balls, swing it over your head like an advanced wrestling maneuver, 
and I hope that you'll like, comment, and or subscribe on this video. Also share it around if you get the chance. Check out the link swarm in the description. We got PayPal for the one-time donations, Patreon for the recurring donations. If you want to get to know me further, we've got Twitter, we've got Discord, we've got Facebook, and my other channel, which has some gaming content on it. And of course, I would be remiss not to thank my gorgeous, beautiful, wonderful, generous patrons. Thank you guys so much. Damon Darkstar, Lady Nix, Crimson Albedo, Dot Nathan, Robert Waits, Just Austin, Pope Squid, Rebecca H, Cider Drinker, and the big boy, Barlos Bugo. You guys are doing so much to keep my motivation high, and obviously if you'd like to join in with them and donate, that would be highly encouraged. But if you don't have the financial means at the moment, then that's no problem. I just appreciate you being here with me today, celebrating your New Year's. Boy, it's going to be a good one. I feel it in my bones. We're aiming for 10k. I hope that you'll enjoy it. Even in the new year, I hope you'll take care of yourselves, wash your hands as much as needed, and don't forget to do something that you enjoy today because you are loved, you are worthy, and you definitely, definitely deserve it. I'll see you in the next one, friends, and until then, bye-bye.